Tom's self-help book is a bestseller, according to him and according to Amazon. He won't actually say how many copies he sold, but he is a number one bestseller and he's got the little orange banner to prove it. He's got clout, he's got cred, he's got an interview on Bloosh. April knows this has got to be BS. There's only one review of Tom's book online and she's pretty sure she knows who wrote it. So April decides she's going to write a best-selling book too. Only she doesn't really feel like writing, so she takes a picture of her foot. She uploads that photo as the cover of her book on Amazon. And as the author and publisher of this book, she gets to select the genres. So she goes with transpersonal and Freemasonry and secret societies. The book is up for sale. She buys two copies and Oren buys a third. An hour later, boom, she's got the banner. She's an instant bestseller. Suck it, Tom. If this story sounds familiar, it's because it's actually true. April is Brent Underwood. Back in 2016, Underwood gamed the Amazon bestseller list with his novel, sorry, his best-selling novel, Putting My Foot Down. He published a piece in The Observer about how he played Amazon and they took the book down. Hilariously, Underwood then published an actual paperback book that consists of 30 photos of his foot and has like actual blurbs and reviews and stuff. And that paperback is on sale on Amazon to this day. Link in the description if you want to support this hero. Okay, so is this video going to just be me trashing Amazon bestsellers? No, it's not. Plenty of Amazon bestselling books are very much legitimate bestselling books. And a ton of them are self-published novels, which lists like the New York Times list, which we're going to get to later, don't even include, and which frankly are selling in numbers that most traditional publishing houses would kill for. What I wanna talk about is how most of these lists don't mean what people think they mean when they think of the word bestseller, and how we as authors and readers and consumers should maybe re-examine how we use the word bestseller. Because that word bestseller, it does give you clout it gives you cred. It can decide whether or not you're going to get another book deal and have a career as an author. It has power, so much power that there are literally books out there about how to get on these bestseller lists. And no, not all of these books are even on bestseller lists. But all that said, the bestseller label hitting that list doesn't necessarily mean a book has outsold other books released in the same time period. And in fact, there are likely other books released simultaneously to this book that actually sold more and didn't hit any lists. Tell me if you remember having this realization as a kid. I know I was younger than 12 because I was still living in New Orleans and I was listening to B97 FM and I was in my parents' car and the DJ came on and said, you know, something along the lines of, and now check out the new number one hit from this new band, blah, I can't remember the band. And that was this moment that I just remember little me going, wait a minute, if it's a new band and it's a new song, how is it already a number one hit? You kind of have that moment of when you start to realize things are a little more manufactured than we're led to believe. I think about this every time I walk into a bookstore, especially a Barnes and Noble, where you see that New York Times bestseller shelf right up in the front. And on that shelf is a debut novel. A debut novel, okay? An author who does not have a following yet. I'm not talking about celebrities. That book by that debut author came out this week and it's on the bestseller list. Literally how? <laughs> <laughs> because it's manufactured. Before a book is released, publishers decide how many copies they're going to print initially. It's called the first print run. This could be in the low thousands, this could be tens of thousands, it could be hundreds of thousands. That means when your book comes out, one bookstore might get less than 10 copies of your book, or they might get hundreds of copies of your book. So picture that, these two different books coming out the same week. One is two copies are put out on the shelf, slid in alphabetical order. And the other, the one where the bookstore got hundreds of copies, we've got dozens of them face out, dominating a whole roll of a shelf. We know how people shop. 
we buy what we see. <laughs> it's human nature to see a big display like that and think, oh, this must be a big deal. I should check it out. When a book is tucked away into that spot, it's way less likely that anybody's gonna come across it. I'm having a hard time even saying any of this because I feel like most of you watching are probably going, duh, this is old news. This is the oldest news. I was born knowing this news. But you know, just in case, an aspiring author comes across this video and you haven't been deep in book and publishing industry nerd land, I want you to know this. I don't want to just say, oh, we all know the word bestseller doesn't mean anything. I want to explain why. And also, also, it does mean something. It means something. It just doesn't mean what we think it means. So am I saying that it's easy to be a bestseller? I guess on Amazon, yeah. It's easy not to be a bestseller, but to get that bestseller label. But otherwise, no, I'm not calling it easy and I'm definitely not calling it meaningless. Yes, the way lists work now has made it so that lots and lots of books can hit the list. But if I were to sit here and say, oh, the list, any list is meaningless because so many books are on it, well, I have over a dozen traditionally published novels and not a single one has ever hit a single bestseller list. So that would be a pretty epic self burn. These lists, including Amazon, but also the New York Times, Publishers Weekly, USA Today, none of them are technically complete and comprehensive lists of all of the best selling books published in a time period. Some of the books that make these lists are statistically one of those best selling books. Others aren't yet, but they become technical bestsellers because it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. When it's called a bestseller, more people read it and there you go. And plenty of books that hit any of these lists last about a week, vanish from the list, and six months down the line, the sales have pretty much flatlined. What I'm getting at is that all of these lists are curated in some way. Publishers Weekly's list pulls data from Bookscan, which gets its data from some indies, Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, and Amazon, but not Amazon Kindle, so eBooks aren't it here. USA Today gets its own data from the same sellers, but it doesn't categorize, it just reports the top 150 titles sold, including eBooks, so you will see more self-published titles here. The IndieBound list draws from over 500 indie bookstores data, but doesn't rank by sales title. It goes by the sales rank each title hits at each individual store. And the New York Times list, the big one, they have a description of their process and I'll link it below so you can read their exact words and take from it what you will. But it's not a list of books with the highest total sales. It's a survey list, or rather multiple lists, and they are based on a list of accounts of buyers that is somewhat shrouded in mystery, and they're pulled for sales on a Sunday to Sunday basis. The New York Times list does include filters. For example, if one book sells really high at one or two stores, but it's not selling at all in other stores, then that book is excluded. Indie bookstores play a really important role in the New York Times bestseller lists, meaning if your book is not in indies, it's almost definitely not going to hit the list. And I mean, I think that's cool, but you know what's not cool? The only reason the Times kind of sort of admits that their list isn't technically, mathematically representative of actual best-selling books is because they had to after the author of The Exorcist sued them in 1983 because his novel Legion should have been on the bestseller list based on his actual sales and it was excluded. The Times won that case. The court ruled in their favor because their argument was that the bestseller list was editorial content, not factual content. The author, William Peter Blatty, appealed his case to the Supreme Court, but they declined to hear it, so the lower court's ruling stood. So yeah, the Times won, but they had to stop pretending that their list of bestsellers was an actual objective list of the best-selling books in the country. And even now, I mean, if you ask somebody you know, someone who isn't really a part of the book industry, what does it mean if a book is a New York Times bestseller? I think it's safe to say that the Times little myth is still going. Most people think it means those are the books that are moving the most copies. But every once in a while, some big event will happen that will expose the list and it actually gets covered in the media outside of the book and publishing world. Y'all know what I'm gonna say next, right? It's time to talk about Handbook for Mortals. 
If you somehow missed this story back in the olden days of summer 2017, I'm actually going to link to an episode of the podcast annotated in the description below because they do a deep dive into the whole saga, including interviews, they do a lot of research, and it's just honestly the best and most entertaining summary that I have come across of the whole ordeal and I couldn't do it any better. But the short version of the story is this. In August 2017, the New York Times bestseller list came out and on the YA young adult hardcover list, The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, which had been dominating the number one spot, had been bumped down to number two. And the new number one was a book that no one had heard of called Handbook for Mortals by Lainey Sarah. 23 hours later, the New York Times pulled that book off its list entirely and The Hate You Give was back up in the number one spot. Why did this happen? It was all because of a very intense and honestly seriously impressive bit of investigating done by readers and authors on Twitter. Again, I really encourage you to read or listen to that podcast episode for the whole story because it is a wild ride. But the short version is this. The author, Sarum, wanted to get a film deal for her story, for her book, and she figured she would have a better chance at that if the book was a New York Times bestseller. So she used her Hollywood connections and hired a company to basically orchestrate a bulk buying campaign, meaning she ordered enough copies of her own book at the stores that were reporting sales figures to the New York Times list to get herself into that number one spot. Basically, she put her foot down, except Underwood spent like $3 and I cannot imagine how much Sarah must have spent. The most infuriating and I won't lie, the most entertaining part of all of it was that Sarum didn't apologize afterwards because she said she hadn't really done anything wrong and she would in fact do it again. And here's the thing, she's kind of right. Legally speaking, she didn't do anything wrong. Legally speaking. After all the uproar, she did an interview on Vulture in which she said, if we listened to people telling us no, women would probably not even have the right to vote. Sarum for sure wasn't the first author to ever do this. This happens all the time. I feel like every other week I'm seeing a story in the news about some politician who bought, bulk bought his own books or her own books to get onto the list to get that clout. There's a long history of authors attempting to buy their way onto the list. Actually, we could argue that the predecessor for putting my foot down was I Libertine, a 1956 New York Times bestselling novel that started as a hoax. This was all orchestrated by Radio host Gene Shepard, who was annoyed at how bestseller lists were compiled and so he hatched a little plot on his radio show with his listeners, you know, completely publicly, and got them to start going into bookstores and asking for copies of a novel called I Libertine by completely made-up author Frederick R. Ewing. Shepard came up with a little plot summary for the book to make it sound more realistic and his listeners just totally ran with it. Until, guess what happened? this non-existent book hit the New York Times bestseller list. A non-existent book. It gets funnier. Demand for this book that didn't exist was so high that Ian Ballantyne of Ballantyne Books, now a part of Penguin Random House, hired author Theodore Sturgeon to write I Libertine based on Shepard's plot, and he did in one marathon session, or at least he tried to, but he couldn't quite make it before crashing in exhaustion, so Betty Ballantyne wrote the last chapter, and the book was published in hardcover and paperback in September 1956 with a photo of Gene Shepard as fictional author Frederick R. Ewing on the back looking, as Wikipedia puts it, as dissolute as possible. The icing on the cake here, for me at least, is that Gene Shepard is the writer and narrator of A Christmas Story, a film that came out in 1983 that's loosely based on his own childhood. The New York Times got played by Ralphie. You love to see it. Nothing I've said in this video is breaking news for any editor, publisher, publicist, marketing expert at any publishing house. We all know it's a game. We all know hitting the list involves a strategy. And most importantly, we know the label bestseller from any existing list does not necessarily mean the book has sold a significant number of copies, however you want to define significant. For the publisher, I would imagine that would just be at least earning a profit. And for the author, earning out your advance and earning royalties. Because yeah, I wanna really emphasize this. There are New York Times best-selling authors out there who have not earned out their advances. They are not earning royalties. 
We know this and we have known this for decades. So why do we still allow that label of bestseller to mean so much? Because we do. Every week when the New York Times bestseller list is released and there's an author on it who is on it for the first time, there's a flurry of social media excitement and other New York Times bestselling authors tell that author to update their bio because we have to splash this everywhere. This is a label you get to carry for the rest of your life. It gets authors invited to speak at conferences and festivals that won't invite authors who actually have a bigger readership but they don't have the bestseller status. So yeah, it's not meaningless, the bestseller label. It means a lot. The problem is that it doesn't necessarily mean something significant has been accomplished. It means significant opportunities are now available. It means, and again, I am not talking about every single best-selling book, but for many of them, it means the publishers played the Laney Serum game on their author's behalf. And now that they have, I'll say it, bought their author best-selling status, the author and that book have a real chance of actual success in terms of sales and readership. Now, I want to stop here and say that this is in no way intended to tear down best-selling authors and books. It doesn't mean those books aren't good and it doesn't mean those authors didn't bust their butts. Most authors bust our butts and there's just a certain point where success is out of our control. Seeing authors I know hit the New York Times list makes me really happy because I know it means their publisher gave them the support they deserve. But I do think as authors we can examine how we react to the list to us hitting the list, to other authors hitting the list. And I think as readers and consumers of books, it wouldn't hurt to have that same examination. And just recognize that when two books come out and one has a ton of buzz and early reviews and the other doesn't, it's because this publisher pushed the book and this publisher didn't. People didn't review this book because there were no advanced reader copies out there to read. Look, I'm guilty of this. When I go looking for another mystery thriller to read because I read a ton of them, and yes, I do read a lot of the bestsellers, I will fully admit that too and there's nothing wrong with that. But when I come across one that isn't getting a ton of buzz and I go to Goodreads and it doesn't have a lot of reviews, there is something in my head that kind of goes, oh, maybe no. Maybe I shouldn't check this one out. And the irony here is that my own books don't have a lot of reviews on Goodreads. Like, I know this as an author, so why do I act this way as a reader? It's a problem, and you know what? It is directly contributing to the dying midlist problem, which is something that I almost went on a tangent on in this video, but I'm just gonna have to save it for its own video that'll be coming out in a couple weeks, I guess. But yeah, there used to be a place in the publishing industry for authors with small but devoted readerships who never hit any bestseller lists but were able to earn a livable wage off steadily publishing novels. And I don't even know if I can say that's dying anymore. I think it's dead. I can't imagine how in 2021 any midlist author is actually able to live off of their novels because that is just, uh, publishing doesn't make that possible. So yeah, that's going to bring me to the honest, introspective part of this video. Am I envious of best-selling authors? Would I be thrilled if one of my books hit the list, especially the New York Times list, even though I've just sat here and talked about how it's all kind of manufactured BS? Yes, I would. I am envious when I see other authors hit the list. I'm happy for them, but I'm also envious because I would love to have that kind of support from my publisher. And yes, if I hit the list with any of my books, I would be completely thrilled even though I would know that it doesn't mean that that book has sold or will sell any better than my previous novels. I would be thrilled because it would be a modicum of career security for me. It would get me into more events and help me reach more readers. It would mean that my publisher backed me up and maybe, maybe the next time I write a book, they'll want to publish it and they'll back me up on that too. Maybe, maybe, because even then, it's not a guarantee. So let me rephrase that. I would be excited if I received a label that doesn't necessarily mean my book has sold any better than any of my previous books and which my publisher essentially bought for me because it would give me a slightly better chance at getting another book deal from them, at which time I could play this whole game all over again with a slightly improved chance at winning. It's a hell of a business.